asked if I would step in this morning and preach. They're coming back uh, on Tuesday, so just keep them in your prayers. Uh, pray that with the rain, with the storm, there would be no uh, delays to their travel or anything like that. Uh, every time I get asked to preach, I uh, think about these kind of popular memes that go around the internet about associate or youth pastors getting an opportunity to preach, and usually they're attached to some pictures of maybe some sleeping congregants or, uh, you know, some conspiracy theorist stuff talking about aliens or whatever. And I, I assure you I will do my best not to go off on any tangents this morning, but I want to say for the sake of those pastors, a lot of the lead pastors are the ones who assign the passages, right? And so sometimes they'll, they kind of control the pe preaching schedule, and so they'll assign these passages and uh, Robbie, to, to his benefit, has always, to his credit, has always been very gracious. He usually gives us the opportunity to come and look at what's ahead, to kind of choose what passages we feel like God is calling us to preach. And so this was uh, one of the times that he assigned a passage to me uh, while he's on this nice, cool vacation <laughs> that I am not jealous of at all in Colorado, which is one of my favorite places to be. So no, uh, no jealousy there, but I'm going to go ahead and read one of the first passages, just kind of look at it with you. Uh, James 5, 1, come now you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. So nothing weird at all, right? <laughs> and this is a solid passage. I mean, just super, super easy to preach, right? So uh, Robbie would never leave me with anything hard or difficult. Obviously, I'm, I'm joking around, but we're going to be continuing our series this morning in the book of James in chapter 5. We're going to read the first six verses together. And before I read, I want to start this morning by asking you a simple question, but I think one that I hope to work through with you today, and that is what holds your focus? What is holding your focus? Macy, our youngest daughter is about to turn 10 months old, which is just, it's crazy to think about that. She's at this, in this phase where she's crawling everywhere. She's into everything. She does this, she does a really weird crawl, by the way. Her legs are straight up. And so it's just, it's awkward to look at. It's very creepy. Uh, but she's just, she's everywhere, right? And she does all these things, but what she's most interested in right now, she is 100% focused on Melissa. She is all about her mom. And if you've ever held her or if you ever see me holding her, you'll, you'll notice this. She does, she does this differently. It's kind of interesting, but she kind of perches. She'll put her arm, like when you're holding her, she'll put her arm on my shoulder so that she can get a good turn to view and scope. She's kind of our observant child. And if I'm holding her and she sees Melissa, her, her focus moves with Melissa in the room. And if Melissa leaves the room, it doesn't matter where I have her, she will try to jump down, even though she can't do all that, and get to Melissa. Macy knows how to focus on the thing that she wants most, and that's her mother. And in today's passage, we're going to be reading about this group of people who are focused on something else, something that has consumed their focus. So we're going to start by reading these uh, six verses together, and then I will work through it a little by little. So... James chapter 5, verse 1, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Beautiful imagery. Just <laughs> poetry. There's so much awesome stuff in here like rotted riches, moth-eaten garments, flesh-eating fire, right? I mean... The list goes on. And all jokes aside, I want us to look at this this morning and glean from this passage some, some truths that can apply to our lives today. 
I'm hoping that this morning we all have focus, we all have things that we're attentive to, and that we could take the time to see where our focus is at and then hopefully shift it to the right thing. I hope that we're able to determine what's holding our hearts and we can learn to better focus on Christ. So to begin with here in James, he addresses a specific group of people, right? He says, come now, you rich. And I'm going to say that there's two kind of possibilities to who he's writing this to, right? Some of the scholars I've had that I've read have said different opinions, right? Some of it are to people that might not ever read this letter, that he's sort of saying this as a proclamation to these rich people that have kind of come in and oppressed people from the church. And he's simply giving this as a warning to us as believers. And I want you to know that I agree with us viewing it as a warning for ourselves. But the other kind of option is that, James, if you remember, this is one of the first letters that was written of the New Testament. He's writing it to the church. He's writing it, it says, to the the Jews in dispersion, the 12 tribes in dispersion. These brothers that James is writing to are all believers who are going through various hardships, their various internal struggles. Through the Gospels, we know that the state, the spiritual state of the people of Israel during this time is not good. It's not where it should be. Um, They're focused on a lot of material things, physical present moment stuff. And James is providing solid instruction on how we should now live under grace as Christians. And so when James says, come now, this is the same type of address that he makes earlier in chapter 4, verse 13, uh, when he's addressing how we should make plans for our life. If you were here a couple of weeks ago and Robbie taught on that passage, um, he shared how James instructs us to, as we make plans, to sort of live it out with this phrase, if the Lord wills, right? If the Lord wills, this will happen. And that is this come out. It actually means it's not, hey, attention. It's come with me. Like, let me guide you. Let me bring you on this. He's saying, come out of, come now with me. It's like saying, I'm going to guide you somewhere. And he's giving them specific instructions. And so far this letter, he's already addressed the rich twice before. First in James chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, he says, Let the brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flowers fall, its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Point here, riches will fade away, right? If that's what your hope is in, that will fade away. And then he continues in James 2, He addresses them again. He says, but you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? In both of these sections, he's providing kind of a soft setup for what he just wrote down here in chapter 5. And I think that James, whether they were believers or not, he is calling for a repentance here. He is calling for a change from how they are living. He's calling for them to shift what their focus is on. And so again, this morning, I ask you, where is your focus? If it's on anything besides Christ, you are in danger of being in the same position as these rich men here in James chapter 5. Whether these people are Christians or not, I think it's easy for us to look at this passage and think maybe he's not talking to us. Like, I'm not rich. Like, I don't fit this bill. Like, this wouldn't be me. But we are rich in more ways than we care to admit, right? We live in an area in time where anything you want is at your fingertips. If you want food, you just have to say a number, right? If you want intimacy, you can go online. Whatever it is, we live in one of the richest countries in the world. And so we can apply these things to our life when we're looking at our focus. I want to read verses 1 through 3 again. It says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and in their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. During this time, being rich, there were only so many things that you could do to flaunt those riches, right? I mean, there would be feasts, lavish parties, those kind of things, self-indulgences, that kind of stuff. Garments were one of those areas. They would dress lavishly beyond what other people might be able to afford. 
And I'm going to ask this question this morning. It might get me in trouble. But do any women in here ever feel compelled to buy a new outfit for every event that is out there? Now, don't, you don't have to appreciate the raise of hand. You don't have to. I'm just going to say that when Melissa and I first got married a few years back, uh, Melissa wanted a new dress for every occasion. And I, I saw this tweet the other day this guy shared. He said, women, the pressure you feel to buy a new dress for every occasion comes from other women. I assure you guys don't care, right? And, and I, I don't want to burst any bubbles or anything, but we don't. Like, I have four shirts, I think, okay? <laughs> this is a new shirt. I got this one recently. I'm going to retire an old shirt. I just, we have a rotation. That's all I need, right? Maybe if, if God ever, look, if God ever calls me to lead pastor, maybe I'll get a pink one. I'll rotate that thing in, right, just to kind of go with Robbie. But for now, this is what I get, right? And so I had this conversation with Melissa early on. I'm like, babe, we just, we can't afford new dresses for every event. And so she, you know, we talked through it. She agreed. She was like, you're right. You know, I'll, I'll stop. Well, then we had Maya. And now Maya needs new dresses for every occasion. <laughs> and then Juliet and Macy. And then I feel guilty because they might get a new outfit and Melissa doesn't. And so the whole point of this sermon is if we could just stop right now and pray for my finances. <laughs> I, would, I would greatly appreciate it, right? No, I'm kidding. But the thing that James knows, the, the thing that he is warning here is that these riches, these dresses, the outfits, the parties, the gold, the silver, all this stuff, it's in a state of decay, right? What happens the moment you buy that new outfit? You stain it. You drop something on it. It gets a rip. It tears, right? What happens when you buy a new car? The moment you drive it off the lot, it loses value. I mean, our things of this physical world are in a constant state of decay. They're constantly losing value. And they will be destroyed. But he adds this line I want to look at. He says, their corrosion will be evidence against you, and it will eat your flesh like fire. What is James saying here? In the end, you see, what we put our faith in, what we put our hope in, is the thing that's going to testify on our behalf. What you're putting your focus on now, what you're putting your hope on now, in the end, is what is going to be said of you and testify for you. This stuff that they are making their identity of, that we can be guilty of making our identity of, it is going to be corroded and decayed, and that is all that's going to be left of your testimony in the end. And then he warns, and at the end of verse 3, he says, you have laid up treasures in the last day. Now, real quick, that in the last day line, I want to look at that, because in verse 1, James tells the reader to weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon them. And then James uses the phrase, in the last days here. And there are several ways that we can read this. There are some ways that we can view this. For one, James and the early church genuinely thought that Jesus was going to come back anytime. And I think that it would be natural for them to think so. This was very early on. Most of them would have, or some of them would have seen Jesus, would have seen him ascend, would have known him. And when he said, I'm coming back for you, it would be natural for them to assume he means them personally, like he's going to return at any point in time. And so a lot of what James shares in this verse is that God is coming back. Jesus is coming back any minute, so be prepared, right? But another thing that he lays out here constantly is that we are all heading in one place. We are all going to die. All of our stuff is going to corrode and fall apart. And so... We have talked about this in our stewardship series this year, one of the main passages we shared. It's very similar language here, Matthew 6. Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. You see, there's a fine line between storing up things for the weather or for a storm that's coming tomorrow, right? or for whatever it is that you're storing things up for and storing up for pleasure, storing up for your own edification. God is not against riches, right? We see in scripture biblical accounts of godly men who are rich and use that wealth for the benefit of the church, for the benefit of the kingdom, right? But we, do, and we also see biblical commands for us to be wise with our finances, to support our family and do all those things. However, the Bible is clear. All of the things in the physical world is going to come into, to an end, and it's in that lens that we should view 
those material possessions. There's another aspect that I want to just touch on briefly, and that is that this passage ends up becoming a little bit prophetic for what the church is going to go through, right? When he wrote this, maybe a few years later, the Roman Empire comes in and just completely ransacks the, the people of Israel. And it's about 70 AD whenever the Roman government comes in and takes everything that they have. And so all of these people that he's warning, don't put your life, don't put your faith, don't put your focus on these riches. Your misery is coming. All of these things will happen to them unless they listened and turned. If they didn't, their legacy would end with the riches that fall in the hands of someone else simply a few years later. Now, James isn't just recommending, hey, Cash out your stocks, it's going to crash, right? He's not just doing that. That's not the point of this. The major issue is that these riches have caused these people to behave differently. It's affected their heart. It's got their focus, and it's affecting how they deal with people. We have, James has pointed to this time and time again in this book, that our actions show what our true faith is, right? Be real, having real faith shows our true actions. And so I want to point out this morning, as we're looking through this, three actions that come with warnings that the rich men um, are doing. And these are actions that we should be careful of in our own lives. These are actions that we should, if we ever see evidence of them in our lives, we should check our hearts, check where our focus is at. And if we see any evidence of them, we should be quick to confess those things, repent, and turn from them. So the first one is James 5, 3, where he says, you have laid up treasures in the last days. What does it mean to lay up treasures? What is the action here that James is talking about? That word laid up means to heap up, to store, and it, it really means to hoard, right? And I love the way that Strong's defines this word. It says, to live from day to day as to increase either the bitterness or the happiness of one's consequent lot. There can be bitterness to hoarding. If anyone here has ever dealt with hoarding, be it yourself or someone else, they know what this means. Most of the time in hoarding, there are things that start off that can make us happy, things that we're seeking after, but ultimately it can make us miserable. Now, I'm going to tell you I'm not a hoarder. I'm a collector, and that's a much <laughs> fancier term, I think, right? Um, but I'm going to confess something seriously this morning that um, when I... What I have at times experienced in hoarding, it has taken me to an unhealthy spiritual level. Melissa and I have shared our testimonies before, um, but I don't know if I've shared this aspect of it with you. On Melissa and I's journey to having kids, um, we experienced five losses, and those hurt really bad. And at the time, I was working for a church. I was working for God. My focus was on the kingdom. I thought I'm doing all of these things that God has called me to, and I think I'm living my life right, and we get hurt, right? And I remember as a husband looking at Melissa during those hurts and thinking, how do I make this better? How do I fix this for her? I don't know if any of you other husbands in here ever have that problem, but we want to fix things for our spouse, right? I wanted to fix things that I had zero control over. There was literally nothing I could do. So finally, I decided to go to the store and buy her something. It wasn't a dress. We already talked about that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, don't, you know, I don't even remember what it was. At first, it was probably some chocolate, maybe some games. I don't know, something to kind of keep her mind off of things. But before long, I feel like any time Melissa would get upset over this, like, my initial reaction would be, like, just run to the store and grab something for her. Like, I'm just going to distract her, right? Um, and it would start with small things, but the amount of stuff that we would buy and the frequency that we would buy things would increase. And while there's a lot more to it to this, I just want to share this one. One of our biggest loss, losses, like, we found ourselves impulsively going out and buying a big TV. Now, I can't handle that kind of expense now that we have kids, but at the time, we went out and made this move, and it's like, what are we doing? We're wasting so much money and time during this point in our life, and I'm not against husbands buying flowers or chocolates or anything for their wives. I think it's good to buy gifts for your spouse to cheer them up and those things, but as silly as this sounds, I sort of began to put my hope in the things that I was getting her to 
affect her and make her happier. And that is not what she needed during this time. When Melissa shares her testimony, she doesn't share that I bought her all this stuff or that I did these things. She probably doesn't even remember all of that. She shares that one Sunday in church, she was listening to this certain sermon, and she was able to give these, this hurt to God and let him work in her life and heal her, and I could have saved my money. <laughs> right? Seriously. Um, I mean, we went through all this, and we were just putting it in the wrong thing, but I also want to confess that during that act of going out and blowing money, if I'm getting something for her, I got to get something for myself too, right? And so it kind of led to some other spiritual pitfalls in my life. I, don't, I mean, looking at me, I know I'm in amazing shape now. Um, <laughs> but during this time in our life was actually like the most weight that I put on. I just, I was binge eating a lot. I was doing a lot of other things. I was depressed. I was spending time just feeling really useless and worthless in our home, all of, all of this, I feel like, started because I was turning my focus to the wrong thing during this hard time. When it comes to our treasure, our money, our time, our things, we have to be careful. We have to be so careful because if your attention shifts, it can lower your spiritual discipline. It can lower your spiritual guardrails. And we have to remember we have a responsibility and encouragement to live our lives as if Jesus is coming back soon. And we should be content with the things that we have here because these things are not going to last, right? We shouldn't be so greedy that we're hoarding whatever our heart desires. Real focus in faith is, comes through contentment. The encouragement here isn't on the money. It isn't on necessarily the riches. But it's on how we're managing that sin. It's how we're managing those riches. James already warned us this in chapter 4. He says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? The more we hoard, the more we love things, the more we become friends with things of this world, the more comfortable we get here. The more our walls come down, the more we work, welcome more sin into our lives and we become enemies with God. And if we're not careful, this, this applies to other sins as well. You can have an occasional drink. That's not a sin. But the more you have, the more you hoard in your life, the more you're likely to become an alcoholic. And once you get to that point or close to it, it can lead to other sins. And you can track that with anything. Enjoying food is not a sin, but gluttony is. Dating and time alone is not a sin, but sleeping together outside of marriage is. The list goes on. Anything that is of this world that we enjoy can become a, a situation where we're hoarding it in our lives and we're putting it first. I am trying very hard to explain to my three- and five-year-olds that too much chocolate will make you sick, and they do not get it. You know the saying, you know that too much of a good thing can make you sick, but this isn't just a warning of that. It's telling us that when we let these things control our lives, our focus shifts, and it becomes our master. Matthew 6.24 says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. We only have room in our hearts for one God. We have one throne in our body, which we can worship. And I want you to think right now, think this morning internally, who sits in that seat? Is it a person? Is it money? Or is it something else? Because hoarding, consumption, whatever it is, is what will drive us in that. And it can become our master if we're not careful. It can take the throne that God is supposed to have in our lives, and like James said, it can make us enemies with him. I think at times in our life, if we're honest, we've all been guilty of doing that. And the danger of it isn't just that, that as if that's not enough, right? But James continues in verse 4 by showing how it can affect our outward actions. James 5, 4 says, Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your field, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. 
these rich businessmen have hired people, these laborers who are working in their fields, and they are bringing in, help bringing in riches, and these men are fraudulently keeping the money so that their hoard of riches would continue to grow. They are cheating people out of money to further increase their own hoard of riches. James has already said that these corrupt riches would testify against them. But here he says this line that's interesting. He puts the focus, he says, the wages of the laborers are what's crying out against you, right? It's these, this hoard that they're building out. It's what they're building out that is testifying against them. Our actions show the authenticity of our faith. And their faith was displaying fraudulent actions. But here's what I want you to understand this morning. Our actions are a byproduct of who sits on the throne in our hearts. If you're unhappy with your actions, you need to ask yourself, where is your focus? Who is your focus on? These rich people, their God is greed. And so their actions align with that of greedy people. When Melissa and I first got married, she was working for this nursing company. And her boss was a very interesting guy. He was, at his core, a businessman. He was from the Philippines, and so we, we had seen some of these different sides of him. And in 2015, he wanted Melissa to go to the Philippines and to help train one of his other businesses there. And he knew that I was a pastor, and so he asked if I would like to go with him. He supported these churches over there, and he wanted me to go and get to see him. And I got a chance to even speak to one where I learned that my type of humor just doesn't translate very well. <laughs> Um, and so it was an amazing trip. I mean, it really was. And so you see this side of him that, you know, he's a family man. He's a, he's a Christian. He's supporting the church. And then over there, we saw him pay off some officials. And we saw him doing some very interesting things. And when we're asking our tour guide, like, what's kind of going on? He's like, well, the government here is pretty corrupt. And so you just kind of adjust and you, you do that. Like, this is what's here. Well, then kind of fast forward, we come back home and there's some other things. Melissa kind of moves up in the company, gets a few promotions, and the guy, um, you know, always took care of Melissa and, and thought very highly of her. We, we shared with, he knew our struggle for having kids. When we found out we were pregnant with Maya, we told him, and I'll never forget that, that night that we told him, I mean, he literally like jumped up and down and had goosebumps and was so excited for us. And then, maybe a few months later, Melissa had this episode where we ended up in the emergency room and she had this tear where they basically put her on bed rest for eight weeks and they told her she cannot work she can't do anything she needs to rest for eight weeks or we were to be at risk of losing Maya and so we broke the news to her boss Melissa went on the bed rest and then he fired her and then we were like what in the world like we didn't see that coming at all but businessmen do businessmen things Right? These guys, people who are, if their heart or focus is on the business, that's what they do. And the other things might be great, but the way that you deal with people is affected by what, who sits on your throne. I'm not going to judge whether or not that was a sin. I mean, I, I think it was. No, I'm uh, but I'm not going to say it. But honestly, I believe that this guy was, in, in his mindset, was doing probably what he thought was best for the business. He did not care at all about the people that were there right? His heart and passion was on that. And this is how it is with us. When sin is reigning in our hearts, when we serve a master that is different from God, it affects how we deal with people. If money is your master, you will deal with people in transactions. If lust is your master, you will view people for pleasure. Whatever master you are serving affects how you interact with people. It creates a lens through how you see people. We've been talking about that on the Wednesday night kind of biblical worldview. Whatever view you hold, whoever sits on that throne affects how you deal with people. God knows this because he created it this way. He created us to worship him, have him as our focus, and then to serve others, to value each other. The Ten Commandments make this clear. The first half of them are how we deal with God. The last, how we deal with people. In Matthew 22, Jesus gives us what's known as the greatest commandment, to love God and to love others, right? Sin not only dethrones God in your life, but it affects how you deal with people. We see this played out in the Old Testament when Adam and Eve first sinned. You know, God creates Adam, 
He has this need for companionship. God creates Eve. They live life in the garden, and then sin enters into the place. And this is Genesis 3, 9 through 12. It says, Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? You have eaten of the tree of which I command you not to eat. So we see immediately the disconnect between his relationship with God. He's hiding from him. He's ashamed. But then the next line, the man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit, and I ate it. The first thing Adam does, throws his wife under the bus, right? <laughs> Just her fault, man. But it breaks down. That's what sin does. It breaks down our relationship with other people. Sin will always come between us and God. Sin is a separator, but it's not just our relationship with him. It's our relationship with others. Sin causes us to deal harshly with people. And these people here, they've let their greed cause them to deal fraudulently with people. They're cheating people. Paul writes this in Galatians 5, 13 through 14. He says, you are called to freedom, brothers. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another. The whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Real focus of faith serves others. And if you're seeing yourself deal with others incorrectly, it's a good indicator that you need to shift your focus and see who's on that throne in your heart. Shift it back to Christ, but also serve. Serve people. Put yourself last and put others first can be a great way of starting your shifting your focus back to Christ. Let's read verse 5. It says, You've lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Again, James reminds them that this is the day of slaughter, the, the end times, right? But this is not the next, but this next issue that James addresses is the life of luxury, the self-indulgence. The word here means to be voluptuous, meaning to give oneself over to pleasure, right? It's placing yourself above everyone else. If you remember James 4, he says, what causes quarrels and fights among you, it's not, if it's not this, your, your passions are at war within you. You desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet, and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Robbie talked about this in that previous week, that pride is what it all comes down to. It all comes back to ourselves. Every sinful action can come down to our selfish passions and our pride. Tim Paul warns about this in 2 Timothy. He says, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty because people will be lovers of self. They will love pleasure rather than lovers of God. I'm going to share this. I'm sure everybody has maybe seen this or heard this before, but there's a show, one of my favorites, it's called Parks and Rec, and there's an episode called Treat Yourself. Anybody know that episode, <laughs> maybe, or the kind of the thing of it? Right, so in the episodes, these two characters have this one day a year where they go out, and there's no limit on what they can do. They get cakes, spa days, whatever. In the episode, they take this character, Ben, it's this long, drawn-out process of him not being happy with anything. And by the end of it, he buys himself a, a Batman costume, like movie size. And I mean, full-on decked out as Batman. And that is what his self-indulgence was for the day. It's a pretty funny episode. But these people, in James chapter 5, they're doing this daily. This is their life. They are living only for themselves. They are treating themselves every day. We start with consumption, hoarding pleasures, and we begin to serve it. We live for it affects our actions. We deal harshly with people. It turns our focus from God inward to ourselves to pride. And before long, the furthest we've fallen from Christ, we put ourselves on the throne and we make ourselves our own God. We make ourselves the primary uh, master of our own lives. In James 5, 6, he says, you've condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. James says that they have condemned and murdered people. But who alone has the right to judge or to take a life? It's God. God is the only one that should be in that position. They have lifted themselves up. They have elevated themselves to a place they are not supposed to be in. And they are now seeing themselves as the judge 
or the arbiter. They are, Peter, is giving, Peter gives a warning to those people who put themselves in that position. In 1 Peter 5, he says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility toward one another. For, and listen to this, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. When you elevate yourself to the level of God in your life, when you put yourself on that throne, God is in opposition of you. You cannot serve two masters. It says you will love one or despise the other. And so a key for us to reshift our focus, to, oppose, to, to move out of that opposition of pride, is to humble ourselves. Like Peter says, humble yourselves there. Humility is the key to real focus. Next week, Robbie will pick up this part of the passage, the next part of the passage in, in James 5, 7. But I want to I read this first part real quick. It says, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Throughout this whole thing, James is reminding us that we should live our lives as if Christ is coming. We should live our lives as if, as if that is who we are going to answer to, because it is. And so that's where our focus should be. As we close today, I want to encourage you, don't let whatever sin you're struggling with to become common. Don't let it take root. Answer that question, what holds your focus? Who sits on your throne that's in your heart? Is it God? Are you focused on the kingdom of heaven? Are you so focused on living authentic faith that like Macy, you are able to seek out your master. You're able to seek out God. You're able to seek after those things of him. Or are we focused on the wrong thing? Are you focused on something earthly, something temporary? Is that what's guiding your actions? The key to real focus for faith is to live your life an anticipation of meeting with Christ. So in light of his return, live your life content with what you have. Put others before yourself and humble yourself to God, giving him full control of your life. Let's pray. Father, I come to you today and I just ask that you would be with us, be with us as we God, reflect on what's in our hearts. God, reflect on who sits on that throne, God, as we look to shift our focus, God, we pray that it would only and always over be on you, God, that you would guard us from sin, from temptation, from things that will steal us away from you, Father. God, I pray that in our lives today, we would, we would live it with you on the throne. We would live our lives as followers of you. God, who views the spiritual kingdom and the things of your grace and your calling, that we would live that out here on earth, and that we would not be so consumed by physical things, by things that don't matter, that we put our faith in, in you and you alone. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.